The spaceship is on a mission to Titan. Astronaut John wakes up in the hibernation capsule. He feels weak after the long sleep. The drugs have many side effects and John needs some time to recover. He is greeted by the ship's captain, Franks. The captain orders John to take a shower and then come up to the bridge to discuss the next steps. Besides Captain Franks, John is met by his colleague Nash. Together they watch a message from the Mission Control Center and receive new instructions. They are to conduct routine equipment checks and prepare for gravitational acceleration. John tries to pull himself together, but this time he feels worse. He struggles to eat and tells to Nash that he can't remember the last name of Zoe, his girlfriend. By evening, John manages to check all the equipment. He records a response message to Mission Control and reports the situation preparing for another hibernation cycle, which will last three more months. A special substance is injected into the astronaut's bloodstream and his eyes slowly close. Memories from the past wash over him and for the next three months he is deep in sleep. The awakening procedure is routine, with John experiencing the usual after effects as his body gradually recover. After a substantial meal, the astronaut spent some time on the exercise bike to ready himself for work. Unexpectedly, he hears a familiar voice. It seems like Zoe's voice came from somewhere nearby. John steps into the corridor and moves through the deserted spaceship. No one else has woken up from deep sleep yet and John feels uneasy. His anxiety heightens when a section of the ship's hull above him begins to loosen. John attempts to identify the issue, but a piece of metal detaches and knocks him unconscious. Captain Franks and Nash lay their injured colleague down and provide medical assistance. As soon as John recovers, the captain orders him to inspect the technical compartment and determine the cause of the malfunction. Under the hull, John finds significant damage and a strange giant dent, but the footage Nash reviews from the cameras provides no answers. No objects approach the ship in the past few hours. Moreover, the dent hasn't caused any critical malfunctions. All systems remain operational. Captain Franks leaves his crew and orders them to report the incident to Earth. He personally heads to the damage site for another inspection. Nash tries to persuade the captain to abort the mission and return to Earth, but Franks refuses to deviate from protocol. There is no serious reason to do so, as all systems are still operating smoothly. The astronauts gather to make a joint decision, but the conflict only escalates. Nash starts panicking, insisting that continuing the mission is too dangerous, but the captain remains firm. Unless new orders come from mission control, they will continue toward Titan. Nash then tries to persuade John to act together. He's convinced the systems will eventually fail, and by then, it'll be too late to save themselves and return home. Their conversation is interrupted by the captain, who calls them to the bridge. Franks admits he overheard everything Nash said and disapproves of his attempts to incite panic. The captain tries to calm Nash, reminding him of the consequences of disobedience and urging them to concentrate on their responsibilities. Despite the captain's orders, Nash persists in urging John. He asks him to set the hibernation cycle for 89 days instead of 90, so they can wake up earlier than the captain and reverse course back to Earth. John doesn't like his friend's idea and doesn't want to be part of a mutiny, but when Nash tells him about another ship destroyed by poor leadership decisions, John agrees to think it over and give an answer after they wake up. John falls asleep again, recalling happy moments with Zoe, but this time the cycle is much shorter than usual. Nash demands an answer from his friend so they can quickly turn the ship around and head for Earth, but John remains uncertain. He realizes that his mind is clouded and making important decisions in this state isn't wise. Jupiter appears outside the window, strengthening John's doubts. They are so close to their destination. This proximity pushes Nash to his breaking point, leading to a heated argument between the two. Captain Franks witnesses the entire confrontation. Having learned of his subordinate's plans, he also altered his sleep schedule and woke up earlier to prevent the mutineers from disrupting the mission. Frank sends Nash to check the systems again to make sure everything is in order. While Nash is away, the captain invites John for a drink to assess his mental state. The commander assures John that he'll cancel the mission if it's necessary, but for now they must stick together and follow orders. Nash's derailed plans push him to the brink of insanity. He causes a scene and Franks decides to relieve him of his duties and proceed with acceleration without him. John tries to stay out of the conflict and pretends that everything is fine, but the breach in the hull continues to trouble him and he often has nightmares where it pulls him into the vacuum of space. Despite his concerns, John ignores Nash's pleas and heads to the bridge to prepare for the acceleration. The team gets ready to approach Jupiter. 
John sets the coordinates and sequentially activates the powerful engines that will take them to Titan. The acceleration is successful and the ship enters the orbit that will guide them to Titan, but Nash still believes it's a serious mistake. John isn't entirely sure they made the right choice either, but he tries to keep himself busy to avoid dwelling on it. While inspecting equipment, something weird occurs. One of the radios emits an unknown signal. The crew debates its origin, with Franks insisting John must have pressed a button accidentally. To end the discussion, Franks orders the astronauts to prepare for another hibernation cycle. This time, the process proves challenging. John collapses to the floor, completely drained. He tries to recover, but while his body regains strength, his mind suffers greatly. He keeps seeing visions of Zoe everywhere. Captain Franks notices his subordinate's strange condition. He tells John to get a grip and realize that it's all just his imagination. Zoe is not and cannot be on the ship. Nash discovers the first signs of trouble. The reactor's power output begins to rise. He's not sure if it's connected to the hull breach, but if it continues, the ship's engine might fail. Nash again urges his friend to listen to him and turn the ship around. He reminds John of Zoe, suggesting that if they don't return now, she'll move on quickly. Captain Franks overhears the men's conversation once again. He summons them to the bridge for a serious talk. Someone, using Nash's password, deliberately lowered the engine's power to stop the ship. The commander won't tolerate Nash's antics any longer. This time he draws his sidearm to show the mutineer who's in charge on the ship. Franks orders the astronauts to return to their hibernation capsules to prevent any further sabotage. But as John's body starts receiving the drug, he sees what the captain is doing to his colleague. He doesn't have time to stop the crime. While working, John's arm goes numb, and he tries to examine it himself, but for a moment it seems like the limb swells and turns into a monster's hand. As soon as the vision disappears, John hears Zoe's voice again, but he realizes this is also a hallucination and doesn't respond to the call. Instead, John decides to discuss the future plans with the captain, but Franks unexpectedly starts talking about John's relationship with his girlfriend. The commander assures him that their romance wasn't real. It was orchestrated to convince John to join the mission. The unpleasant conversation unsettles John, and he heads to the workshop to focus on his tasks. Unpleasant thoughts and memories prevent John from concentrating, but suddenly the radio crackles and he hears the dispatcher's voice. The astronaut tries to report what's happening, but the connection keeps cutting out and he can't hear a response. Frank summons John to the bridge. He demands to know what John was doing, and upon hearing about the conversation with Houston, the captain insists it was another hallucination. The captain orders John to return to his capsule and go back to sleep, but this time John's nerves snap. He demands that Frank's wake Nash up and prove that his friend is okay. Taking advantage of a moment, Franks attacks John and tries to force him into the capsule, but John manages to break free. A fight breaks out between the two men. John is stronger, but he can't win the battle with his mind as easily as with the captain. John reaches the central computer to find out which chamber Nash is in and if he's alive. While entering the request, he has to fend off Franks, but finally the computer starts searching for the astronaut. The answer John receives leaves him in shock. The program confirms that Nash is alive and on the bridge, just like John and Franks, because all three names belong to the same person, Captain John Franks Nash. John realizes that he's been alone on the ship the entire time. His companions were figments of his imagination caused by the repeated use of hibernation drugs. John loses his last bit of strength and doesn't know what to do next. He returns to the workshop holding the service pistol. The astronaut tries to contact Mission Control again, but for a long time, the radios remain silent. Finally, one of the radios turns on and John hears Zoe's voice. She says she's at the ground control center and was invited to speak to him. He claims that Zoe's voice is just another hallucination and the story about underground tunnels and earthquakes is a fantasy his mind made up to explain the situation. Franks tells John that if he depressurizes the cargo bay, all that awaits outside is the vacuum of space, which will pull him out and end his life. John hesitates briefly, but Zoe's voice gives him strength. He doesn't listen to the captain and opens the airlock. At first, it seems like Zoe was right. John finds himself in a shaft and hears her voice nearby. He walks toward the light, hoping to soon reach the surface, but space engulfs the astronaut's body and carries him into the infinite void. That's how the movie ends. I hope you enjoyed.